Welcome to Bar Chart's weekly series of webinars designed to help you, the trader or investor, better understand a variety of trading concepts and ideas, as well as the pages and tools Bar Chart provides to help you make a more informed investment decision. Today's subject, well, we're going to do a little something outside the box, a question and answer session with me, John Rowland. Uh, we did this similar session back in November of last year, and you know we got a lot of real positive uh, feedback. Um, so I thought we might do it again, or at least try to attempt to do this again. So what we basically did was we sent out an email blast to all of our subscribers and asked them if they had any ideas or aspects or wanted to talk about tools or just some general questions they had about trading and or bar chart. And like the last time, um, I was really humbled and overwhelmed uh, by the response that we got. And even up until just literally minutes before we came on live here, you know, we were still getting a lot, a lot of questions. So I thank all of you for sending all the questions in. I just want you to understand that, you know, because of time screen, we're not going to get to a lot of those last minute questions. And, um, but not only the number of questions we got, but also the depth of detail or the, the knowledge that you guys are asking. So what we did was we picked out a couple handful of questions that we thought had a universal trading theme and or um, we thought would um, have a common thread, you know, for uh, for trading. So. With me today, as always, and those and who helped me in our selection process is my partner and our monitor is Ms. Jean Baker. Hello, Jean. Well, hi, John. How are you? I'm I am uh, excited about today's session, but I'll tell you what, I'm like, wow, I was just like really, really impressed with all the questions that we got. And so you helped me gather and categorize a lot of these questions and you helped me select them. But I think you might want to also address to our listeners some of the issues that we have with this. Well, not not issues necessarily, but um, a lot of the questions that came in were very specific. And again, John cannot offer specific trading advice here today. Uh, we will try our best to screen through those questions that are not answered in the session. And uh, if we are able to, we will we'll have support reach out to you after after today. But um, we're, we're hoping for a great session that everybody can pick something up uh, and, and learn something new. That, that's the reason for John doing this for you. Yeah, so just to reiterate what Gene's saying, here's our main page that if you scroll down to the bottom, if we don't get to your question today or you didn't get a response, just reach out to us through contact here. This way we can respond to your questions. It would be right, the really bottom right, more. Yeah, the bottom right, right corner of the scene that says contact bar chart right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That'll, that'll get you directly to our support group. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Great. So, John, let's get started with some of these. Great questions that were submitted. Okay. Oh, All right, you, so first, you want to go through your disclaimer? Go ahead. Yeah, just real quickly, uh, the disclaimer. Um, you know, just remember that all trading has a form of risk and that we at Bar Chart recommend that you uh, seek the advice of a qualified financial advisor and that things that I'm going to show you or past performance, things that worked in the past and are not guaranteed um, uh, or in, indicative of future results. And there's no, I'm not here to endorse or, or uh, recommend any particular stock or uh, strategy in that. So just keep that in mind as we go through our process today. Okay. So ready, Gene? Let's jump right into the deep end. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is co a question that was very common among our subscribers is this confusion uh, that we have between uh, bar charts opinion and analyst ratings. OK. All right. So. Um, I picked a stock that I think that's really kind of bring bring this home, which will relate back to this question. So here's GameStop, right? And um, 
Over here under our menu selection, there is a spot where it says under technicals, bar chart opinion. I'm just going to show you these in the drop down box. If I minimize my menu, it says bar chart opinion. So we can go there or right over here. And this could be a little hint for you guys is bar charts, technical opinion. So we'll just go there and what bar chart technical opinion is based upon is a culmination of these 13 technical indicators and you can see there most of them are moving averages or macd's so what happens is one of these uh technical indicators is going to give us a signal and that signal could be a buy or a sell or maybe a hold. And so, for instance, on the 20 day moving average here, you can see that price has gotten above the 20 day moving average. So, the common interpretation on that particular indicator is that that is a buy signal. Okay. So, what we're seeing here for game stock is that all 13 of these technical indicators are showing or signaling a buy meaning that price is above those uh, those indicators right so it's not like us sitting around you know campfire and say oh let's recommend buying GameStop." all we're saying is here are all these technical indicators are now showing um, a buy signal now it's not as just easy as you know all 13 right a hundred percent right there is a formula that we kind of do on this one and that formula is based on um signing some points to the different signals and that that's where you'll get those 24 percent 28 48 56 8 percent right that's how we get that percentage number but if all of them are saying buy then it's going to be a hundred percent okay so the second part of, I think it was Roger's question was analysts, right? So I'm going to go in here again in this drop down, and I'm going to go down to analysts. And here we have a page that will look at what our analysts are saying about this particular stock. Now, uh, we'll gather the information from all the analysts that are covering that particular stock. Sometimes we have don't have any analysts that are covering the stock, so you might not have any analysts. Or you have, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 uh, analysts. For game stock here, it looks like we have five or six analysts that are covering. And the analysts will update the ratings. Most of them are on a quarterly basis, but you can see that here we do have it on a month to month basis. And again, those ratings will be based on this scale, strong buy down to strong sales. So you can see what is the breakdown among the different analysts, right? So analysts typically rate stocks on fundamental matrix, right? EBITDA, earnings per share, positive cash flow, all those uh, different um, metrics. But bar charts opinion, remember, is based on technicals, okay? So Roger's question is, how can bar chart give a hundred percent buy signal and an analyst have a hundred we'll say a strong sell signal because we're looking at two different types of analysis one is technical and one is fundamental all right so another question that is a very common theme that we get from a lot of you folks is that they don't understand the signal, the strength, and the direction and how we can use these uh, in our trading. Okay, so again, here I'm back at GameStock and I'm under the opinion, again, what is each one of those common interpretations of those technical indicators, but I can go to strength and direction and what this does now is strength will look at these indicators over a longer period of time, a little bit more historical. For stocks, it's about 200 days, I think, and for futures, it's 100 days. And direction is more of a short-term momentum, three days, right? And again, in our help section here, we tell you how we categorize 
strength and direction in terms of terminology, right? Okay, so I can look to see what is that trend over a longer period of time. Is it strength or strong or maxim? Or what is it doing in the short term? So one example of how I could use this, if I was a long-term investor, I might make uh, sure that I have a strong strength, you know, an uptrending longer-term indicator. But maybe uh, I would look for increasing momentum um, in my direction. So one of the things I'm going to do throughout our session today is I'm going to refer to this page, which is under our tools section, free webinars. And then a lot of you folks know where this is because you know we talk about it a lot. And so, Rotella, I would go down to here, and here we have a webinar where we really go deep into the weeds about how to use strength and direction to do trend and momentum analysis. So I would recommend that you would go there. Okay, great. First question done. Sweet. We're, all right, let's go back to, and there's our strength is a longer term picture, 200 days for stocks, and direction is a shorter term picture, uh, three days. Okay. All right. So here's a question. Um, how do you determine the best time to do a leap options? Well, first of all, what is a leap? Well, a leap is a long term equity appreciation security. What really it is, is an option that has an expiration date that is longer than one year and typically a duration of about three years. So the question here is what is the best time? I don't know what she's asking in terms of like in the morning or in the afternoon or at the close. But you know, if you think about timing in these ones, is, is timing that critical uh, because of the length of time of these options, a year to three years, right? But how far in the future and uh, the availability of the option could be a factor. Or typically, traders will use leaps of indexes, right, the broader market, instead of individual stocks as a hedge to their portfolios. Because what, what could happen in, let's say, three years' time, a stock could go to zero, right? Um, but in three years' time, I doubt if... Uh, an index is going to go to zero. I mean, we'd be in some trouble if some of our indexes went to that zero. So timing-wise here, um, I think what we can think about is we might enter based on a defined business cycle maybe, for instance, a, a beginning of a recession or expansion or maybe an election cycle or an earning cycle. Um, you know, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, you know, looking to say, hey, we're going to talk about the reopening. Maybe we want to, we want to invest in stocks that we think it's going to take a year for them to reopen. So I, I think, you know, as far as timing is concerned, you know, you know, you got to think big picture, right? Big picture, six months, years, right? Um, but you know, you know, when you're talking about a three-year option, you know, I think to pinpoint a particular day or a specific moment, you know, I think is not as critical. Okay. All right. So this next question has uh, three parts to it. So first, let me just read the whole question to you guys. And then what we'll do is we'll break it down. So uh, this is Ed's question. And Ed says that he noticed that it the beginning of trends in many stocks happen when you have this positive volume. Now, I think what Ed is saying here is maybe uptick volume at the end of the day. And assuming that day traders are getting out of the market and institutionals are aggressively buying in. So, Ed, yes, that's exactly what happens. Usually, as the market comes to the close at the end of the day, day traders are closing out their positions and institutional traders are coming back into the market or establishing positions or doing whatever as the market is coming towards what we call settlement. Now, he says that he has noticed that there's these patterns that happen over three to five days and that that can set about a trend direction. 
awesome job, Ed. Great insight. That is exactly what happens. Markets go through these cycles of three to five days. These trends that we are looking at typically happen in this cycle, right? You know, three days to five days, a week to week, that kind of thing. So you're doing a good job, Ed. You're making sense of the whole process. Do you know of a technique or a strategy using bar charts tools that can help you look for this cycle or these potentials? Okay, so let's go to, I'm not going to go to game stock. Let's go to stock that everybody is familiar with, Apple. And I'm going to go to my interactive chart, right? And once I pull that up, I'm going to go to a lower time frame. And I picked one month uh, because what I want to do is I want to look at a 60-minute interval, right? So every one of these candles here represents uh, 60 minutes in time. Now, Ed, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a study. Now, your discussion is based on volume, all right? So I'm going to look at something called volume moving average. And I'm going to add this to my chart. Now, we can pick different time frames for our moving average. You, we'd say over a week, five days, or nine days, or 20 days, or 100 days, and look at a moving average. But I'm going to look, because I'm going to be using a chart of an interval of one hour, I'm going to use 6.5. Now, why do I use 6.5? How many hours of the day are there trading for the stock market? Well, stock market opens at uh, 9.30 Eastern time, it closes at four, six and a half hours. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a baseline based on the average pro volume over one trading session or that six and a half hours. And then we're gonna make some assessments, okay? So I'm gonna add that. Now, let's go to, uh, here's our volume and you can see this purple line represents our average right our average volume but notice that we do see these spikes in volume now what i'm going to do here is i'm going to put my cursor right on these spikes and notice that on the bottom here we see a time 9 a.m 3 p.m 9 a.m 3 p.m 3 p.m 9 a.m 3 p.m 3 p.m 3 p.m 3 p.m. This cycle, right, is not unique to Apple. It happens in all markets, right? What is happening here, it happens in all markets, futures, options, everything, right? There's an adage, you've probably heard this maybe, that goes something like this. Novices or retail traders open the market and professionals close the market, right? Novices or retail traders trade on emotion, they pick up on a news story or they, the fear of missing out and they rush to go to the market in the morning and professionals, they take their time, they do their analysts and they will come back into the market at the end of the day. They want to get into a position that they believe after they've done maybe some buying during the day and maybe to uh, enhance their position. Sometimes you might have heard that refer to it as paint the tape, right? Let's so say I bought a lot of shares during the day. At the end of the day, if the market is rewarding me, I might bid the market up to make, look, make those shares that I already bought profitable. And you'll see that uh, institutional traders will try to paint the tape, especially at end of the month, and quarterly times when statements are about to go out to you know kind of fluff their results so good job ed yeah this is exactly what is happening so what can i do or how can i use the technique so this is a technique that you can kind of look i'm going to look at these spikes in volume where i go above that moving average on those critical times the close which is what you have noticed and you know the matrix i'm going to use here is you know maybe two times the average or two-thirds of the average or something of that and that could set up the next trend or give me a clue uh, to the next trend so the one that i see right here that really stands out is this big candle here or this big volume and you notice this is a 3 p.m and it's this candle here Right. So what is this telling us? Big down volume, institutional selling. 
right? And that has set up for a potential downtrend over the next three to five days. And that's exactly what we saw here. Now, this one would be a little bit more difficult, but certainly the same concept. Here we see a large uptick volume, big volume that came at three o'clock. But notice our candle. This is a really teeny small candle. A lot of volume jammed in a very small space. And if we look at price action, we were in a looks like a dominant downtrend for a certain period of time. So this could be a combination of short covering by our institutions or our institutions are telling us that this price is probably a low price and that they're willing to invest in this stock where our retail traders or the public, the general public is fearful or trading in motion or selling the market as after price has already gone down. But if I go to, let's say, a higher time frame, that May 12th low, where we saw our institutional traders are buying that uptick volume, is in line with an area where we would anticipate certain support. So what we can do, Ed, is look at that volume, an increase in volume in these critical times in the mornings and in the afternoons, to help us discern if there is a trading opportunity, but I still need to do some chart analysis to look to see where I'm in, in terms of my trend and where my support or resistance, okay? So that is a potential trading technique based on um, our closing volume. Okay, cool. Okay, John, All before right. you, can you go back to the Apple chart for a second? Uh, yeah. Aaron has a really good uh, question and something that other people might want to know on your chart you started off with the 60 minute chart right the mo one month on your volume uh your moving average volume study at the bottom there's a purple line and you have the parameter set to 6.5 can you explain why you did that yeah i think i did i said that there are oh. six and a half hours in the day of a trading session for the stock exchange right the market right. opens up at so, 9 30 yes. in the morning closes at four that's six and a half hours so what i'm trying to do here as i'm looking at an average volume that is spread out over that six and a half hours right okay? so if, and you, if, of, if, you, if you changed your chart to a daily chart that that 6.5 you'd maybe want to uh, manipulate that parameter a little bit. Is that correct? That would be correct. But just remember that the parameter here is 6.5 period. So whatever time frame my chart is in, the interval, it would re represent that period. So if I went to a daily chart, then I would be looking at a moving average of now, let's just look at the moving average right now. It's around 0.29 million, right? Now, if I change it to a daily chart, now I'm looking at a 6.5 daily moving average. Notice now my moving average is around 60 million, right? Because that's the volume of a day, a whole Perfect. day, right? Not in yeah. terms of an hour. Okay, okay. so I hope great. that, Aaron, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, great, all right. Okay. All right, so what's our next question? All right, so this one I really like because it's kind of really a lot of junior traders have difficulty to this one. So the question comes in and says, I'm focusing on one stock or one futures contract. Okay, let's just stop there. First of all, I think this is actually a good strategy for somebody who's just starting to trade, to pick one stock or pick one futures contract and learn – uh, become the master of that, right? Don't be the jack of all. Don't try to learn all the markets at once. But there's a problem here or a caveat, and that is if you only are trading one market, then you are limiting yourselves to potential opportunities. But that's okay. So it goes on, the question goes on and says, I'm I'm watching one market and it's not presenting any daily uh, trading opportunities. And I'm staring at the chart and I inevitably get into a bad trade, all right? Who's done this, right? Exactly, right? That FOMO or uh, forcing a trade. Do you have any advice that can help me? And this is from uh, Sharif. And so, yeah, I have advice for you, all right? This is trading. 
okay? Not every day does a single market present you with a strong high probability trade, okay? So here's kind of my rule. And this goes back to the last question is, I look for opportunities in those first three hours of active trading, that was eight to 11s in the morning, when I know retail traders are trading with emotions or they're making those mistakes, right? They're driving the market out of balance, right? And creating trading opportunities for me. And if there's no opportunities that don't happen for me by 11 o'clock, then bam, I'm done. I walk away, I enjoy life, right? That's one of the benefits of being an individual investor or a day trader, right? Is that opportunity to do other things. I don't need to sit in front of the screen all day and wait for something to happen. Now, what I might do is come back at the end of the day, that last hour before the close and see if another opportunity presents itself, okay? So, Patience and time discipline are important part of all trading plans. So let's go back to our webinars. And inside of our webinars, we discuss this in our how to build a more successful trading plan, talking about not only giving ourselves permission to take trades, but also giving ourselves uh, permission not to take trades, right? It's not about quantity, it's about quality, right? And FOMO or that fear of missing out, well, I'm gonna tell you from experience, the only thing you're missing out when you force a trade is making money. You might get lucky, but in the long run, you're probably gonna give uh, money back to the market, all right? So be patient, wait, Wait for great, greater trading opportunities. And what we've just already learned is let's wait when we know the market is out of balance or when trends are starting to be developed or when market is starting to move in the mornings, in the afternoons. Okay, great question there. All right. All right, so the next question is, why is selling options more profitable than buying? I love this question, right? Well, a couple things here to talk about. First, there's this persistent myth regarding options that 80% of options expire worthless, right? Which leads to a misconception of selling option premiums is the way to go when trading options, okay? Now, there are true, there are advantages to selling options when the conditions or the risk managements are favorable. And yes, many professional options traders or market makers will prefer to trade positive thetas, in other words, selling options, because they're going to capture that time to get decay. But here's the facts. And it's true that only about 10% of all options are actually exercised, right? So that's how you get that myth of, oh, well, only 10% are exercised, the other 90% must uh, expire worthless. But again, the facts are is that according to the CBOE, that about 60% of all options are closed prior to expiration, all right? So selling or credit spread type trades might be the way to go. That's what is kind of the myth here. But if you don't understand the risk involved, or what I see is a lot of retail traders look for credit spreads or these uh, capturing credit type trades where they're willing to try to capture a very small premium on a trade of low probability outcomes, right? Now, on the floor, we used to call this um, trying to pick up quarters in front of a steamroller, right? And you can pick up a lot of quarters, right? Because steamroller moves real slow, right? As long as you don't trip or fall. And if, but if you trip or fall, you're gonna get crushed, okay? Now, there's a second part to this question is, Michael asks is, will market makers influence equity prices around options expirations depending on the put call ratio? Well, 
I don't think the word influence, Michael, is is right here. What we do see as as we get towards that expiration day is market makers will do something what's called an arbitrage. They will make a bid and ask based on where they could sell or buy an option where they can be neutral to price direction, right? And then the last trading day. And the other phenomena you will notice is that a lot of times this arbitrage action happens around a strike price that has a large amount of open interest. Remember, 60% is already closed prior to expiration, so that other 30% or so are, is still in the market. Now, some folks have to wait until the last minute before they make a decision, or they just hold on to that position. So a lot of market makers will have this window of opportunity, this arbitrage window of opportunities where they can trade neutral to the direction and they're just trying to pick up little nickels okay but they're professionals and they're not retail traders right yes the put call ratio could give us a clue to what side of the strike we might and typically we see more calls than uh, puts but you know if i have let's say a hundred dollar strike and I have a two to one put call ratio. And then, you know, maybe what we might see is that that arbitrage window will shrink as the day goes on, as we get closer and closer to the end of the day of expiration, but it might, the price of the stock might settle just above the strike price because of those calls, right. Or, or below because of the puts. It depends right so it's not really their influences they're just reacting to the less of the open interest and they're just trying to pick up those little nickels at the end of the day but for us for retail traders michael be careful playing this 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 little game all right make sure you understand risk because i don't want you to get run over by that steamroller of volatility. I think this is a funny picture, right? You kind of made, try to make a steamroller here, right? Because I have seen some really crazy stuff in the last minutes of expiration, right? And I've seen retail traders pick up a ton of quarters and then one bad trade wipes out all of those profits. Okay. Our next question is, can you provide some advice about when to close out or allow a trade to go to expiration? I think this is from Chris, yeah. So this one really comes down to the risk of holding a trade, right? Or going to term, going to expiration. And what type of option or strategy you might be employing. So if I'm doing an app, excuse me, an out of the money, let's say I'm doing a debit strategy, I'd paid premium, right? I know my risk is limited to the premium I paid. So I might uh, decide to hold that risk, right? That premium that I paid, I might hold that, you know, in hopes of getting one of those steamroller events, right? Um, and letting that expire worthless, right? But if I'm on the credit side, right? Then do I want to risk a steamroller event to pick up that last nickel. In other words, right, I have a put I sold a put that is way out of the money and now it's it's worthless. It's coming into expiration. Do I want to stay in that trade to pick up that little extra, you know, 10 cents or 5 cents when something weird could happen and all of a sudden that option goes from out of the money to in the money, right? So again, it's really up to the individual trader, but I personally wouldn't try to do that. Um, if it's in the money, you know, what is the risk of ownership, right? Or assignment, okay? Uh, the capital outlay or the price uh, depreciation. And if there's an assignment risk, I might lose ownership, right? You know, let's say, for instance, a covered call, right? Do I want that event uh, to happen. And um, if my trade plan has worked and I've achieved a large percentage of my goal or targeted price action, what I thought was going to happen, do I ring the register if I get 80 or 90% of that and walk away no matter how much time remains? Yeah, I do. Because I don't want to risk 
that time decay, or I don't want to risk my vanishing profits, right? So again, this is more about philosophy of an individual trader. But you know, if I get a trade that in you know a week's time, even though I set this trade up for a month or two months, and I get 80 or 90 percent of that potential profit in that very short window, yeah, I'm going to ring the register and move on. And I'm not going to look back and say, oh, I could have gotten that extra 10 or 20 percent because I could also have gone uh, against me as well. All right. How can you determine the price range of an option on a particular equity, right? So this one is kind of an open-ended question, right? Because there are so many different variables that are used to predict the pricing of particular options, all right? But let me see if I can show you in bar chart how we can kind of help you a little bit with this query, all right? All right, so let's go back to Apple and hang on. I'm gonna go down here where it says volatility and Greeks. And inside of here, this is a question was from Sonia. So here's all those factors that are going to influence the price of our option, our implied volatility, de uh, delta, gamma, rho, theta, vega, and also the price of the underlying stock, right? Those all have influence on our options. So one of the things that we do offer is that we give you something what is called the theoretical or hypothetical value of that option. We take in consideration of all these variables and it gives you a value. Now ours is done in a binomial model. There are other models out there, Black Shoals and whatever. So, you know, it depends on your platform or whatever model you want. But it, again, it's just gonna give you a kind of a theoretical value of your option at that moment in time. So what you can kind of do, Sonia, is, you know, you can look at, now I'm looking at an options that are only have two days to expiration here. So probably these are pretty all right. Our market makers are um, on top of their game. But let me just go out one week and see if we can find something. So what I can do is if I look at an option and its last price is, let's say, greater than the theoretical. So a couple things is it's telling us is first is that maybe that option is overpriced, right? Or it also could be telling me that somebody is purchasing that option um, and regardless of the theoretical value, because they want those contracts or they want that options. And vice versa, if I'm looking at, let's see if I have an example here. I don't see one here on this page, but let's say I look at my last price and it's below the theoretical. Again, that could be telling me that my option is cheap compared to the theoretical, or it also could also be telling me that somebody is selling that option, right? And they don't care about the theoretical, that's about selling those options, getting those contracts, or getting rid of those contracts, right? So you can use the theoretical versus the last to kind of give you, you know, kind of an eyeball where price should be compared to where it is. Now, the other thing we can do is we can look at delta, which is one of the components that helps uh, provide us information on the cost. And the delta is basically the sensitivity of the option uh, to the price movement of the underlying. And so what we see is that delta is represented by a dollar move in an option. So for instance, currently Apple's trading in 127. If I look at the 127 call, my delta here is 51.99. Let's round it up, let's say 52. So what it's telling me is that for every dollar movement in Apple, my option here is going to change by 52 cents, okay? So I can kind of use this as a gauge, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go back into here. I'm gonna to go to technical analysis. And over here, we have something called average true range, which is a measure of volatility based on past price movement and it gives us kind of an uh, implied range of where the underlying the stock the range of price that has happened over a certain period of time nine days 14 days hundreds is what we have available for you 
So if I'm looking at an option that is going to expire within a few days or a weekly option, I might use the nine day ATR. If I'm looking at a longer term dated option, I might look at the 20 day. So we can see that the average to range for nine day for Apple is $2.05. That's telling us that about we can anticipate Apple is going to range between $2.05 today. Well, we know the delta, the delta is 52 cents, right, for every dollar. So let's kind of just round this off. So if we get a $2 movement in Apple and we have a 52 delta to our option, then our option is going to move in range of around a dollar and four cents. Okay, so let's go back to our Greeks. Go back to that monthly. I look at my 127s. I'll go to price history. Now, Apple's still trading today, but we can see that yesterday, between the high and the low for this particular option, the range was about a dollar twenty. Okay, and what do we say? Dollar five, right? So this could help you determine the range that your option could do. So if you are at the full range of your ATR in terms of your stock and your delta conversion based on the low or the high of where that option is, that could tell you that you're at that range of that option. Now, again, options are subject to price movement and volatility and other things. There's a lot of other things, but that can kind of give you uh, an eyeball. And then what you would do is at the moment of execution, you could look at your th your theoretical and say, okay, is this option overpriced or is this option cheap? And that could set you about which side of the trade you want to take. Okay. So that's Sonia's question. And again, Sonia, theoretical value can help us determine if an option is overpriced or underpriced. Our, and our delta ATR combination can help us figure out our option price range. Options, options, options. A lot of options questions, Gene. Do we a have any other options. questions? <laughs> yeah. Really, we had a lot of options questions, and um, we are taking everything into consideration for future webinars, so I just want to let you know that. While I'm on that point about future webinars, so we had a couple very specific questions come in. John, why don't you let me take this one here, uh, give give you a break. Um, so what do you need me to Go. pause my screen? Oh no, just hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to, okay. I'm going to talk about two questions in particular that came in. Uh, Gopal was asking or saying that many of the chart of the day stocks are already at high points and the RSI is over 70. Uh, can you tell us when we can use RSI or other bar chart indicators to uh, purchase or sell? And then we had a very similar question from Murray about using RSI and stochastics. So here's what we're going to do. We actually started um, planning for future webinars and the whole concept of the RSIs and the stochastics and using that with uh, using that with trade planning with we're going to do a webinar on that so instead of just answering that question here today uh, on July 21st we are planning a webinar to talk about stochastics and RSIs and how to best use that with finding possible trading candidates Okay, John. <laughs> well, listen, I think what folks listening here is is how important it is for you guys to continue to interact with us um, and send us your questions and send us your suggestions and send you your ideas because we do listen to you. And Gene will tell you that a lot of the webinars, when we go to our planning sessions, we like we go, we just go right to the source and that's you guys. And we look at the questions that you're asking and see if we can't, find, again, a common thread or a, a theme that we can put a webinar idea together, right, Gene? Absolutely. So 
Keep your questions coming. Uh, you can either send them directly to support or you can send them through to um, webinars at barchart.com and we read each and every one of them and take them into consideration. So thank you. Awesome, okay. All right, let's see. I do see a couple of questions. I think we answered Aaron's question about um, the number of days used for the purple line. Um, I see a question here about, can you explain unusual options, activity? Um, so Abdullah, you know, I would, I know you just joined, um, go to under the webinar session. We have a really good uh, webinar on op unusual options activity. Um, I would recommend that. Uh, Bill's asking about tools found uh, for trending stocks. Uh, that might be beginning of periods of a pivot. Again, Bill, what we might do is look at those uh, bar chart and indicators and knowing that our stocks have maybe come into a downtrend and you want to look for a beginning of a new uptrend, we want to see a change in the momentum. This, in other words, we might see uh, the strength is still pointing down, the signals are still selling, showing shorts or sells, but the direction is now turning up, which would be a mo change in momentum. So you know, give that a try. Um, so Alan uh, asked about trading futures and and when starting the day, what time frames should we use? Well, you know, I'm going to do a futures example in, in a second. But you know, again, you know. You know, futures, we, most futures contracts we trade for up to 23 hours. Not all of them, grains a little bit less. Um, but I would look at what would be considered what is called the regular trading hours or what were the old exchange hours. So if you wanted to do that kind of analysis in terms of the openings and closes. Um, but if you're trading a global futures market, let's just say a currency or a metal or oil, you know, don't discount looking at price action during the morning sessions, well, let's say in Europe. So if you live in the Midwest or on the East Coast, you know, or you know, between like one and four o'clock in the morning, a lot of times in crude oil, you will see the beginning of trends and increase in volume. So you probably don't see as much volume as you would see during the US session, but those are definitely great spots or time frames to start looking for uh, trading opportunities. Okay. All right, next question. All right, so this one again is a multiple question. And uh, what is your pre-trade planning for exiting trades as it becomes a loser, right? Uh, do you look only at reversals or do you use some kind of a drawdown hybrid? And what is your standard max drawdown? Okay, so this is from Patrick. And so Patrick, let's break this question down into a couple parts here. So first of all, um, Every trade is different, right? And it's based on your trade plan, right? It's purpose, right? Are you trying to create wealth, right? You know, building a portfolio, um, or are you, you know, income trading and just trying to create income? Uh, the style, right? Am I a long-term investor or am I doing a swing trading or am I a day trader? I'm only trading what? And then my goals. Now, my goal is not to make money, right? That is not a goal. That is an objective, that, right? I want you to start thinking about goals in terms of like a means to net. In other words, I'm a wealth trader because I want, my goal is to build my wealth so that I can retire or leave a legacy for my grandchildren or something. Or uh, if I'm an income trader, right? I want to suppl supplement my income or I want to be able to, you know, say, goodbye to the man and be an independent uh, trader if I can do that. Those are the goals. Or, you know, maybe I want to buy a vacation home or a muscle car or whatever, whatever floats your boat, all right? So the next process is that pre-trade plan exit strategy, okay? So Patrick, um, again, I will refer to you guys to a webinar, and this is one of the webinars that I've done just recently. I'm, I, I'm, I'm quite proud of this one, and it's under here under, under our trade plan is how to plan a well-executed 
or uh, exit strategy, okay? And so in this webinar, we walk through those stages, the pre-planning stages, uh, the during stages, right? Exit strategies, and also what you could say is a post or permission to close strategy. So every trade starts with a stop. And on the pre-entry, we wanna make sure we have a risk uh, factor or a risk assessment, how much we're willing to lose. But once I've set that risk, then I also can set a target exit in the pre-planning. So before I even enter any trade, I have an exit already planned to when I lose money or uh, when I make money, all right? So you asked some kind of specifics in terms of percentage drawdowns, right? So if I'm a wealth trader, uh, Patrick, then I'm going to be looking at a percentage of the initial investment, right? So let's say I invest $10,000 in uh, a stock. Now, that's going to vary depending on the stock and how I define the risk of that particular stock. If I'm buying a large cap and it has dividends and, you know, like an IBM or something to that effect, uh, you know, then maybe that's a little bit of a stoic market. Maybe I'll have a little bit of a uh, a tighter uh, initial drawdown, maybe let's say somewhere between 10 to maybe 15 or 20 percent, right? Where I think that, um, you know, how much am I willing to, you know, let that trade play out over a longer period of time, right? If I'm trading a more volatile stock on an investment basis, you know, maybe I'll give that stock a little bit more room because it's a lot more volatile, but here also is the difference. I might not invest 10000 in, let's say, for instance, a game stock. Not that I would do that anyways, but maybe my initial investment is going to be a lot less. So even though I'm willing to risk maybe, say, 30% or 50% of a drawdown on an investment on a riskier stock, it would still be a lot less than maybe a more stoic or large cap stock where I think you know, I'm in it for the long run, all right? If I'm doing swing trading from week to week, month to month, so that kind of thing, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a percentage of price movement. In other words, how much will I allow that stock price to move? In other words, if I have a $50 stock and it moves $5, that's a 10% price movement. Now, for me, you know, somewhere between 7 and 10%, I would think is could be a correction, especially if I have a 10% price movement from a recent high. But if that stock gets into, let's say, 12 or 15 or 18%, then that could be the beginning of a downtrend. So, you know, again, it depends on the volatility of that stock, but I will look at a price movement to define where I would get out. But I'm also going to now start adding a dollar value. I'm going to say I'm not going to risk I might risk a 10% price movement, but I don't want to risk more than, let's say, $500 or $1,000, right? Um, so that's where I start bringing in a dollar value based on a swing trade because I'm not in for it for a long period of time, only in for maybe a week or a couple weeks, right? And if I'm doing income or day trading, well, I'm going to flip this, okay? I'm going to first start with a dollar value. I'm going to say, I'm going to enter a trade, and I'm not going to risk more than X amount of money, let's say $500. And then what I do is I will go to the chart, and I will look at price action to help me set my risk. So, for instance, I might look at a trade and say, hey, here is an entry that I really like. And if price falls below this weekly low or below this area of support, I'm going to get out of this trade. How much risk is in that in terms of a price movement? In other words, in a dollar value. So let's say that I have a trade that looks like the entry to where I would stop myself out based on that price action is $250. But I said that I have a hard I can risk up to $500. Well, now what I can do is I can start using leverage or what we call position sizing. So if I have a $250 risk based on a price action and I can risk up to $500, now I could take 
to contracts. So learning how to position sizing, especially for income traders and swing traders, is really the key to long-term success in terms of a trading. So learning how to use leverage and position sizing based on the price action and a modeling of how much risk I'm willing to take. Now for futures trading, I have some very hard and set rules. The first one is I use 2% of dollar value risk of the total equity that I have or the risk capital that I'm using. For instance, if I have a futures account that has $25,000, 2% of that is $500. So I will look for trades where I my risk is $500 or less. Now, what I try to do is find trades where I can find entries that are a lot less than $500, you know, let's say sub 250 so that I can take on more contracts. Now, the other part of my equation here will also be margin, right? Now, we can margin in stocks, you know, two to one, four to one, but in futures markets, we get anywhere between 10 to 21. But how much margin that I have to put up? So the other hard, fast rule I have in trading futures, Patrick, is I only use 50% of my total margin available to me. So again, if I have a $25,000 account, I'm only going to use $12,500 worth of margin to trade futures. Now, if I can take three contracts or four contracts based on the dollar risk, do I have enough margin? If that futures contract has a margin value, let's say of $5,000, then I can only take two contracts, even though the risk will maybe allow me to take three to four contracts. So it varies, right? So, um, Again, that webinar about exit strategies is in there, but also that other webinar about building a trade plan, we go into there. And the other one that Patrick, if you're interested, that what I just went through under futures trading, right? Another one that I'm really, really proud of is trading futures markets with limited capital. And that goes through that process of using dollar risk and margin uh, to find greater trading opportunities. Okay, really great question, Patrick. Thank you so much for asking that one. All right. All right, where are we at? Oh, we're getting right there, right, Gene? Good time. We are getting right there, right towards <laughs> one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what is the most important element you use on bar chart to identify long and short trades for both futures and options, and this is from Aaron. Aaron's in the room, right? Heads up, Aaron, thanks, appreciate it. Okay, let's start with futures, all right? And my go-to or my must-have, what I can't live without in terms of barchart.com, in terms of looking for opportunities for futures, is the futures trading guide. Now, notice that I do say here, I'm gonna use multiple time frame trend uh, analysis and I do what we call a top down, right? Uh, high to low, weekly, daily, and hourly. Now, my time frames could be different, but that's kind of just giving you that sense. All right, so under the futures section, we have something called the futures trading guide. This is a th hypothetical um, trading system based on the nine and 18 day moving average and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna to come to this in the early morning sessions, just before you know my markets start to get active that eight o'clock in the morning. And I'm gonna to look to see if there's any new trading opportunities. Now, for instance, today we gave us a signal that says that its start date is today and that it gave us a buy signal. So what I would do now is, I'll do that top-down analysis. I'm gonna start at the weekly, I'll go to the daily, and then I'll go to a lower time frame to see if I can find an opportunity to get into what I would believe is a new buying opportunity. But I still wanna make sure if I'm buying, I want those trends to be lining up. So what I'll do is first I'll look at the details of the trade, right? Is it a buy or is it a sell, right? And I can see that my moving average is a crossing, right? Um, it does look like something might be valuable here, right? Um, you know, then I'm gonna go to my chart and do that analysis, right? That multiple time frame analysis. 
And so I'll start, let's say, at that weekly interval. And what's my trend? Well, my trend is still up. Now, it had a big impulse. It's had a correction. And it looks like it's kind of holding right where it should. So the bigger picture here, I'm going to look to make sure I still see a very strong trend. But also what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of define my price in terms of what I consider would be a cheap value and what I might consider would be a, an expensive value. And so you can see that in the range of our last two big weekly pivots, right, we're kind of on the lower end of that range. So in that sense, I would say prices are cheap. And where could price go if this trend gets back in control? Well, it could go all the way up there. So this is going to afford me uh, a lot more potential profit. And then I'll go to my hourly excuse me, my daily. And again, I'll look at my trend. Now here, my trend is not as strong as I saw on the weekly. We've kind of come into consolidation. But again, price is kind of holding in an area where we would anticipate it to hold. So it's not going to discourage me away from this trade. I'm just going to be a little bit more cautious because my daily trend is kind of looking a little sideways here. So now I'm going to go to that lower time frame, right, to look for entry. So I've already just said that the signal from the futures trading guide is a buy. Uh, my trends are up in the higher time frame. And in my daily, I'm kind of in a range or sideways action. So maybe I want to look to where I can find a price entry a little bit lower where I can get into that trade. Now. I looked at this this morning. I didn't take this trade, but here is a nice little doji, which I love, right? You know, battle of indecision, battle between buyers and sellers. And price, you know, shot away. Not only did it show away, but it had a nice trend. And this is the first time we've come back and tested that, right? So we're coming back to an area of a higher time frame trend where we're testing them. And that would have been an opportunity for me to get in right around here. And you do see that price did come down and trade at that value. Now, this is the July contract, to be honest with you. I probably wouldn't be in trading July wheat because there's only a few more uh, days before the end of the month before that uh, uh, contract expire. I might look at the December contract. And if I went to the December contract, it would show me a similar opportunity, but unfortunately, whoop, w, WZ, unfortunately, it wouldn't have gotten to my entry. So I wouldn't have gotten the trade anyways. All right. But that's kind of what I do using um, the futures trading guide. Okay. That's really how my you know, that's really where I start my trade. So you can see here that, yeah, I didn't get, would have, wouldn't have gotten that trade, right? And that's okay, right? That's part of trading, you know? So um, again, right? Not forcing a trade, waiting for the opportunity, being patient, being disciplined. Now, the other thing I we talked about is time of day. Now, look at this, right? This is right in that sweet spot, right? This zone is in that sweet spot for grains, right, towards the end of the day, right? That's where grains close, right? So again, reinforcing some of the concepts that we've already built upon just in our session today, okay? So for um, options, Aaron, I love the unusual options activity, right? I love that page. I think it is a great place to start to look for trading ideas, and again, you know, I, running out of time, we're at the top of the hour, we've gone a little bit over. I wish I could go a little bit deeper into this one, but under my options um, webinars, we do have it where it is understanding unusual options. So go into that one, and we go a lot over a lot of different opportunities uh, turning to options. Now, what I will do for the unusual options is um, – I'll go into my screener emails, and this is, I think, is part of, uh, of the process that we need to do as traders in terms of to help let Bar Chart do a lot of the work for you, is 
I'm going to send my screener based on the unusual options activity screeners that I've already developed that will help me really narrow down those trading candidates. And I'm going to have that sent to me at noontime so that I wait for the market, the options market to get up and going, right? And that let those trades start to develop. So Gene, help me out here. I think for free subscribers, they can get end of days, but only premium subscribers can get uh, uh, the midday. Noon. That's correct. Mid one, yeah. One other thing I want to um, point out, if someone is interested in unusual options activity, uh, if you go to the that page, John, just go ahead to the options, unusual options activity right there. Uh, there is an option to get an end of day email right here. John was talking about uh, setting up a screener for unusual options, which you certainly can do to further narrow down the candidates. But you can send yourself an end of day email here. You'll get the list of uh, stocks that are on this report, stocks, ETFs, or indices, whatever you prefer. The midday reports are premier options. So yes, you can do this based on just the data that you see on this page, or you can get the emails based on a screener you create off of the unusual options activity. Great. All right. So I'm looking at a lot of, I think Gina sent through a couple of questions. I think we pretty much gotten through a lot of the questions that you folks have. So if I didn't answer your question again, I would encourage you to send them to our support through our support, contact support um, button down here. And um, anything else that I forget, Gene? Yeah, so let's talk about next week. Usually at this point, John goes to our webinar archive page, the free webinars, and at the very top, he points out what we're going to talk about next week. Well, we're, we're not going to be here next week. We're taking a little summer break. <laughs> so, well, um, right. You above, deserve it, right? A well deserved and an overdue vacation, right, Gene? I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, are you willing to disclose where you're going to go or are you going to keep that private? Oh no, I'm keeping that private and just just getting away Much from respect. getting away from the desk. That's all. <laughs> so the other thing I want to point out, right above that blue box on our webinar archive page, there's this. Uh, you can add your email address to our webinar notification list, and you will be the first ones to know when we schedule one of these educational webinars. Otherwise, come back to this page, check. Yeah, probably sometime next week you'll see the announcement for our next schedule session. But if you and want if you, if you want us to notify you, just sign up on the webinar notification list. Cool. And I will hint to you guys that when we come back from our 4th of July break, uh, that we do have some really cool subject matters. I think I can talk about those, right, Gene, right? Oh, we talked yeah. about the RSIs. We're going to look at candlesticks and we're going to look at different types of charts you know not just regular bar charts or candlestick charts and i think by that we'll put us into august then we'll start back up on our options we're going to go into some more um we're going to do the strangles and orlando i know you're out there I promise you, we're going to get to butterflies and iron condors eventually. <laughs> eventually, yes. We're just working down the list. Lots of options, questions. Okay. All right. So, listen, folks, uh, like June says, I hope to see you all in our next session. And uh, I want to say until then, you know, stay safe, uh, the best of all health, and the good of all trading. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention today. And we hope to see you back in the our upcoming webinar sessions. Have a great day. Bye.